What's up, people? Welcome to this episode of the By the Hood podcast or webcast because I don't know how you're consuming this content. I'm your host as always. My name is Jimmy. And as we start off every show, that's with gratitude. Just want to say thank you to everyone and anyone who supports anything that we do. Special shout out to all the students from By the Hood University, as well as the youth from the By the Hood Ownership Camp. Shout out to all of you guys. We definitely appreciate the support. I got my partner in Crown Core with me. Core, what's up, good brother? That's really good. You know, every day is a good day to be alive. We're not going to complain about being alive. Let's go get it. It's 2022. Let's go get it. Yes, sir. And as you know, our podcast is designed to highlight brothers and sisters who are doing amazing work, putting out positive energy, building businesses, just positive attributes, uh, positive people, rather, I should say, in our community. And the sister that we have on um, is one of the top loan officers in the area. But her story is amazing. First of all, I just want to say this before I bring her on. I feel like I know her whole story because she has her own podcast. And in the first episode of her podcast, she told her story. So I feel like um, I feel like it's a cheat code because I know like pretty much uh, everything about her. At least, at least that's the way I feel. That's how transparent she was in that first episode. And we're going to talk about that, too. But we have from Medicine to Mortgage, Elizabeth Paris with us. Elizabeth, how are you? I'm all right. Thank you both. Jimmy, Corey, listen, y'all know I rock with y'all the strong way and the long way over here, right? So thank you Absolutely. for having me. Happy to be here. That's all I got on Tuesday after a long weekend. I'm trying to make listen, it. Listen, listen, we finally <laughs> made it work. Um, you know, we've been trying to do this for a while. Listen, um, and, and Corey, she, so Elizabeth's brand is um, Medicine to Mortgages, but she has a podcast. And I want you guys, we're going to start there just to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Um, I listened to your podcast, your first episode was actually like um very inspirational right I, I have this um this thing where i admire people that are uh, able to be that transparent mm-hmm. and you know you were sharing stories and things about your past that i'm like most people like you know won't even be willing to share that um so i'm gonna start with this Ooh. though before we get into your past what makes you um have enough strength to be that way uh ooh, there's a lot of self-work my, I'm gonna just be 110 percent on that. Um, that journey just to get to the part where I can actually talk about it, that's a time. Um, a lot of it. So I'm I'm still I'm a deeply spiritual person, so I'm always gonna say God. Um, but even when I was going through it and then when I was just sitting at the end of everything where I'm like making a transition, I was like, I have to tell the story at some point. There's there's no way around it. I've always worked in some type of community capacity working in mental health, doing group therapy, always kind of really been into like motivational, you know, inspiration type situations. So I was like, I got to talk about it. And really the strength just came from just surviving it, to be quite honest with you. Um, once I was like, all right, you alive, you got your your mental, you got to tell the story because I knew so many other people going through it and they couldn't talk about it. You wouldn't even know. They just kind of disappear. Like life happens, shit goes, um, stuff goes left. And, hey, that's fine. Hey, listen, that's fine. <laughs> we get it. Um, and that's it. You don't hear about it. You don't hear about how they recover. You don't hear if they make it. That's there's nothing. There's nothing there. And I know too many. I know too many minority um, students, physicians um, who came from low income housing, poverty, who made it to like high educational situations, got overwhelmed, didn't make it. Silence. That's it. There's no support. There's no there's nobody to, to help them get through it or even say, hey, it's OK if you didn't make it. Yeah. And let's talk about that. Though. Let's let's start with your journey, because um, and it's funny because after listening to that, I'm like, oh, so now the brand and everything makes sense. The brand medicine to mortgages. Right. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about this. Um, let's talk about, you know, your very beginning. Where are you originally from? I'm originally from Prince George's County, Maryland. Um Pretty girl county is what they call it. Don't confuse PG me. County. Virginia. PG County, right? Don't don't confuse <laughs> with Virginia. Won't claim them. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I don't. I love DC, but I always read PG County. I'm a PG County girl. Grew up Temple Hills, Maryland. Right. Okay. What, what kind of student were you uh, coming up as a kid? Um, I was a good student. My parents kind of strict on school, so you no, know, we we read our books. We got our good grades. We stay focused and out of trouble. <laughs> out of mouth on me though. Um. Uh, Oh, I, used really? to, I, used to, I used to spit truth a lot. My mom would tell me, like, I have no cut cards. If you wanted the truth, you always got the truth. And sometimes that gets you in trouble. Ah, sure. But, but but you know, so you, you talk about the pressure um, from your parents in terms of, like, uh, academics. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, talk about that. You said your parents. Um, where are your parents originally from? So my parents are from the islands. My dad is from uh, Trinidad and Tobago. My mom is from St. Kitts. I'm a first-generation immigrant, so I've 
was born here. They immigrated here. They met at a bus stop in D.C. Shout out to love. Um, <laughs> but for for them, it's they came here for a better life, came here to create for themselves. So is, you know, education is the number one thing. Right. You're always going to be educated. You're always going to get your education, try to get a good job. You know, they sell you the dream, American dream, get a good job, get the house, American dream. Um, and those are my parents. That's what they came here for. So my joke is, and for a lot of us who are first generation immigrants, the joke is you have four options for a career. It's, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer, or fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and That's the funny it. thing is, you're not the only person that say that. Um, we had someone in our pot, I forgot who it was, but they said that they had a seven figure successful business and to their parents, they still were a failure because they weren't a doctor. I'm yep. like, damn. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, that's 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 crazy. That's crazy. All right. So, you know, so you're dealing with that pressure as you're going through school. So um, what was undergrad like for you? Where did you end up going to undergrad at? So I went to Johns Hopkins University for undergrad psych bachelor's uh, did pre-med. Um, I'm grateful for undergrad because of the people that I know and the network that I, I created or I have now. Wonderful, just black alumni that I'm we're like here. But uh, PWIs or predominantly white institutions are a special form of hazing. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. They're a special form of hazing, in my opinion. Actually, not just my opinion. So you really are dealing with a culture shock because Prince George's County is very insulated. Like, yeah, it's, you know, it's told it as the richest black county. It still has its spectrums of, of income. But a lot of it's insulated because I was I went to black schools. I went to black elementary schools, black high schools. And if there was an intermix of people, maybe, you know, some Filipinos, Latinos, but majority of my life experience has always been around black folk and looking at black folk come up, come down, whichever. Um, so going to PWI, you get the shock where you're really like, there's maybe 50 of you and everybody else is white. And we mean white, white. Yeah. So it's, yeah. that was just another level of, okay, I got to learn how to network, cool, how to move in different spaces, but wasn't my favorite experience, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, it's funny because I've been through both um, PWI and HBCU, and it's not the same. Like HBCU, it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain to someone that's never been to one. Mm -hmm. It's almost like it's almost like going to like a family reunion, but everybody's focused on education. Well, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of you focus. It's it's weird. It's like the camaraderie and the the way we look yeah. out for each other is a little different. The um, culture is different. It's just the 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 culture is we got you, you got me. Whereas PWIs is like, some might have you, others might just be trying to throw you under the bus to, to get them. Yeah, that's, the a step, so. yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. I, um, so I pledged an undergrad, I pledged Delta Sigma Theta and that gave me more of the culture and then being able to go to Morgan was just up the street. So we would go to Morgan state university and hang out. I had friends there. So I, I didn't miss too much, but from an academic standpoint, you could just see the way, in which the rigor was different in the way you were regarded by your professors, you just weren't getting a lot of chances to, to fail, yeah. or to struggle. And that came up in medical school as well, because you're still dealing with the same same headaches. Yeah. So let's talk about that, because this is what you were very transparent about. And I want everybody to go check out your podcast, listen to the first mm -hmm. episode. Um, but tell me a little bit about um that story, about the pressure, because again, you talked about, you know, pre-med. So the, the, uh, the plan was, to become a doctor, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what was that experience like when you, you know, first got to medical school? I was exciting at first. I was like, yeah, we in here, put the work in, we grinded it out. It took me a little while to get here. And as I say, like it took me six years to get there, but you know, I built so much of a resolve, like we're going to get it done. And then I got there and um, the metaphor is like drinking from a water, house, water hose. It wasn't even so much just a, a lot of the information I learned differently and I learned very quickly in medical school, I learned differently. That's not the way in which they structured their coursework. It was really like, do it the way we want you to do it or you going to figure something else out, which for some, it meant you're not gonna finish. Um, so we got there and I'm just a person of, I don't wanna be in lecture. I just wanna be at home studying, do the ways in which I like to learn my information. They made mandatory, they made lectures mandatory. Um, not a lot of supports <laughs> to help you if you're struggling because they're they're utilizing other students who are struggling to help other students who are struggling. It's like that. Which medical school did you go to? Uh yeah, I'm uh, not not that. Oh, you don't okay. All right, we ain't gotta put them out there then. That's no problem. No problem. Yeah, 
they got means, that means you about to slander them. That's what that means. Oh, I'm, oh, oh man. Uh, <laughs> they're just one enough supports. And when I tell you they're one of supports, like no tutors there. You try to talk to professors. I mean, I, I got to the point where one professor told me, oh, you're just not used to failing. That's why you're struggling. And I'm like, no, that's not the issue. The issue is not failing. The issue is I need support in figuring out how to best prepare for your coursework because I understand the information. I can talk it through with you, but now it's not translating on your exams. So how do I conquer that? And literally old girl was like, you're just not, you're just not used to failing. You know, you just need to, you need to just be okay with failing and try again and maybe you didn't do so well in your master's program so whoa you know whoa. um mind you I, I did very well in my master's program <laughs> like it's it's um uh, it's it's incredibly it so what's your master's degree in uh biomedical sciences sheesh biomedical sciences that sounds uh difficult <laughs> I, I, when i tell you I, rocket I, I, science <laughs> and the crazy part is like I did a lot of med school courses in my master's program and I aced them like I worked really hard doesn't like it took six years but we put in the work so to get to medical school to know that I'm struggling and it's not like it's information I can't conceptually understand it was like okay I just need some guidance here for lack of better words hand holding people don't like to say that but to be quite honest sometimes you need somebody to kind of like hey let me I got you you know what I mean HBCU I got you. You got me. That does not exist in medical school. At least a lot of them at the time. Maybe they've changed. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so there wasn't there wasn't support from faculty. Students were doing their best. I had maybe like one or two physicians who were teaching who knew I could handle the work, who saw what I was doing, saw how I managed with a lot of the uh, some of the patients we got to see. So they knew I could do it. They were advocating on my side, but unfortunately. The people who had the final say were the ones who basically were just like, you're not capable. And that's that's really what somebody said to me. They're like, you're just not capable. And you need to go back and get a second master's degree in order to show us you're capable in order to do it according to whoa, whoa, our school. Stop mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Slow down. Yeah. You got to go get a second master's. So you got to mm -hmm. get another 60, 80, 100,000 dollars in debt and then come back and get more. Oh, slow down. Yeah. That's what they told you? That's exactly what I was told. Oh, you. Oh, man. That's man. exactly what I was told. So mind you, we know for minority students, if you don't get scholarships through most of your schooling, you are taking out student loans, which is why most of the most of us who have student loan debt are black. <laughs> and they're not great terms. Like a lot of us are waiting on student loan forgiveness. Right. I, I don't hold my breath on that one. But I, I'm not. I'm not. I promise you, we just. Either OnlyFans is going to get started, I'm going to keep doing this mortgage thing. But you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's a lot of us have this debt. So I went to expensive undergrad. That 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 degree holds its weight. I will say that I went to expensive undergrad. I did get some scholarships there, but not a lot. I then went and got a master's degree. So we're now in the six figures of student loan debt. Now let's add in two years of medical school. And you want me to take grad school courses, which I did take some and those didn't work out because it was just like mentally I couldn't take anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that's what you're that's what you're telling me. And I know for a fact you're not telling some of your other students that you're giving them time after time after time to the point. So I was like, well, why don't you just get a learning disorder diagnosis and maybe they we can go from there. So you're telling me to go back in a second message. You're also telling me to go talk to the, the school psychiatrist so mm -hmm. I can get prescribed um ADHD meds or anxiety meds something that they were trying to get me on and then get diagnosed with the learning disorder so that I could get more leniency to get through medical school oh my god now how would that affect you in the future if you went through with that um there are a lot of things that come up in regards to getting hired as a physician like mental stability and capability yeah. in certain jobs um, set you up to get slaughtered yeah and then we're also talking about I still have to get through residency so now I have a learning disorder um and i'm dependent on meds that's a whole nother conversation like and i'm telling you like literally these are the things that were being said to me like oh we'll do this do this do that because nobody could really figure out um how to actually be supportive in a way that made sense so these mm -hmm. are things you're dealing with again as a minority i can't i can't speak for any of the non-black students yeah. who were in attendance but mind you there's only maybe 10 or 15 of us in a class mm. 
right? We're talking two, maybe 200, 250 students altogether. Of those 200, 250 students in the medical school, and I'm, I feel like I'm giving way too much, too many people to be in, but we're talking maybe 15, 20 are black. So yeah, about about ten percent of the of the whole total population. I, and I might be, I might be. Yeah, I think you off. I think you might have been like it might be eight or ten of y'all, and it just felt like twenty of y'all. Listen, if, if you're going through three or four years, now, let me ask you this, of, right? Yeah. All right. So so you know, I went to law school, but part of that that that, and I went to a PWI for law school. Mm-hmm. But um, and and shout out to like it was it was mostly women. Shout out to all my sisters, like who who went with me. We were was black students. And right. was, I shouldn't say the same because it wasn't the same pressures, but there were certain things that we dealt with that other students didn't. But that actually made us bond together. And we had conversations that would meet up and talk about it. Like, was there any sort of camaraderie or like building with you and the other eight students in the class? Um, Unfortunately, not consistently. No, I mm. actually was closer to some folk who were a year behind me um, than I was with some of the folk in my in my course and like in my class. And that's just, you try to have conversations with folks, try to figure out who can be supportive. And I'll, I'll take, I'll take accountability on my part. Sometimes it's not easy having the conversation of, I am struggling to get through some of this coursework. Can yeah. you give me some guidance on what you're doing? Um, and some of them did their masters at that school. So they had insight to how those professors already taught things of that nature. So I would ask questions, but Again, learning styles are not the same. Everyone's on different schedules. And some folk really weren't interested in like really trying to help you get where you're trying to go. Yeah. But they want to they want to know what's going on. So there's there was a lot of there's a lot of mix of contention and not as much support. But I'll take accountability to say some people I didn't fully reach out to. Um and then others when I did, it wasn't it wasn't as helpful as I needed it to be. Got you. That's unfortunate though, because we gotta stick together, especially in spaces like that. We, we got to, um, you know, and, and and shout out to everybody to, you know, because like I said, we stuck together and that kind of helped. Absolutely. But, you know, we need to do more of that as a people. But um, so what is this like now um, when you have all this pressure coming from home to 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 be the doctor and you're struggling, right? And you're trying to mm-hmm. figure things out. How do you deal with that? Um, I crumble 110%. And I say that because I was the first person in, I would say, immediate family, which means most of my parents. My mom went to college. My dad did not. Um, first person go to medical school. This mm-hmm. is a foreign concept to uh, to them. To in regards to supports, there was a lot of other like familiar stuff going on too. That unfortunately, it's just like if you're the person who's you're usually the person who's holding shit together, and now you're trying to handle some other things. You're not that rock anymore. So that was also that was just a challenge trying to balance putting in boundaries, balance out the family stuff where you're the responsible adult or you're the one who's taking care of a lot of things that come fall on your plate. And then now you have a very full plate and it's like, you got to become a doctor because you know what that means to your family's future financially. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not happening though. And That's now I can figure out. Yeah. Cause I, I worked, I also worked my entire way through. I worked in undergrad, worked through grad school. Um, ho, 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 ho. I need to stop you here again. What kind of job <laughs> can you hold when you go out? <laughs> like, cause I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that because you know I'm 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 sloth like I, I can't do anything. <laughs> so but, so you mean to tell me you was going to med school, you was taking care of family, and you was work? What kind of job did you have? So I and through I always worked in mental health through undergrad, grad school. So I still worked in the inpatient psych unit here in um, in New Jersey. Okay, and I was full time, and then we just picked up occasional shifts here and there. Don't ever do that shit. Sorry. If you're a mess with <laughs> <laughs> all off. Um, but you know, again, as I said, like you have I'm I'm not necessarily I'm gonna say I'm tapped on student loans, but there's a limit to how many student loans you can take out. So at the same time it's like you're trying you're 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 really working poor in medical school. You're not if your family doesn't have the finances to support you, um like some students are fortunate enough to have, you're trying to figure that out on your own like how am i going to eat where's the money coming from if your folks are not in a position to to funnel you money yeah it's a lot it's a lot because you got to you got to cut something off and i ended up stopped working but then it was like i need to get on food stamps and at that time i actually couldn't get food stamps while i was in medical school cuz pa kept denying me so got to figure out finances got to figure out how to eat got to make sure i'm studying got to put all my time into studying still got to manage what's going on with family Still gotta try and sleep. 
it wasn't a good mix, y'all. I can tell you that right now. Like I say, I can take accountability, but I can also sit and say, you just want enough supports, not at the school, and then trying to figure out my supports from the familiar side as well. Because then they don't know what this journey is for me either. Because so, they've never been through it. They don't have the they don't yeah. have that experience to say, look, do this, yeah. go to get, yeah, go there, talk to someone. So like they don't have those kinds of yeah. So yeah. you didn't have any guidance from home. Mm-hmm. And you weren't getting support from school, so it's kind of weird, you know. I listen. I I have a similar story, nothing near like like I said. I don't. Yeah. I'm not smart enough to do anything that you did, but no, you're smart. <laughs> listen, degrees don't mean nothing about intelligence. Please let me. No, 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 no. I, I, I said I'm not smart enough to do what you did. <laughs> I am not. Listen, if, if you haven't heard my commentary on how I feel about actual, the the actual vast majority of people in their level of intelligence, um you would know that I don't think that I'm dumb. I'm just not doctor level smart, right? So what you were doing was something that for me, I didn't Mm -hmm. have that in me. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dare try that. Like when I was going to school, I did, I did all kinds of stuff, but I did everything I could not to be doing that. Like that's just, that's work. Like I ain't like, that's work. I ain't doing that. Like (laughs) this this conversation makes me think about this conversation makes me think about like um as a culture in a community how um we're playing from behind like that's the bottom line right so when you're playing from behind you don't have people with those experiences a lot of us were first generation college so mm-hmm. you don't have anyone that's been through it so when you're going through anything you know i remember going to college and you know i tell the story often about like credit card debt how i ran into crazy credit card debt and i would talk to my mom she'd be like don't get the credit cards they're bad but she can never really break down why Cause she didn't really have the same experiences I had. So she just like, don't get it. I'm like, whatever. They're giving me free money. What do you mean? Don't take it. They're giving it to me. I mean, I didn't understand, you know, what they really were doing. They were being predatory, but that's either here nor there. Um, but just a lot of experiences you have when you're the first person to go through something, you don't have anyone to lean on. That's a whole other thing about, you know, the wealth disparity and just like the fact that we're playing from behind. So I, I can, yeah, that's kind of crazy. Like that you had to deal with all that. Like, I feel I feel crazy. I want to like go back and give your old self a hug. Like it's gonna be okay. <laughs> it's, 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 I, that's what we did with therapy. And the crazy part about it really was is making peace with that, right? And so mm-hmm. that's when I'm like, really, like, where do you find the strength? Honestly, because I I know so many. I've mentored so many uh, college students where we they've had to cha- make life changes. Just as college students, you're twenty something years old, and you're like, I don't necessarily want to do this anymore. That's okay. You yeah. don't have to. You can do something else. Um. But and even again, full adults, I, there's so many other med students who just haven't finished or they've made career changes. And it's it's a it's an inner turmoil because, again, you were given this pathway because it was gu- guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say quotation is supposed to be guaranteed. A lot of things for minorities, particularly black folks, just isn't guaranteed because we're not even given the same playing field to accomplish the goal. And we're overcoming so many other things along with that. So I literally shout out everybody who has finished medical school, gotten through it, found those resources, found those support, went through the stress, went bold, grew the hair back, whatever it is. Um, I commend them every day. I have plenty of friends that are, that are physicians, but I also know there's another part of that where that struggle doesn't, it doesn't end happily. Yeah. It doesn't. And it's a shot. It's a shot to it's a shot to your self-esteem. It's a shot to your ego. And it's not even just becoming a doctor, buying the house, um, building a credit score, earning mm-hmm. more income, um, being the single mom. Like a lot of those things, they're not the exact same. But to me, they're all parallels because it's something you you want and you hungry for it and you working your ass off to get it. And you just keep hitting the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this. What was that what was that moment or or time when you decided like I'm done with this? Like what was that moment like? Yeah, what's the effort moment? Uh that effort moment, I literally was uh cleaning a living room <laughs> and I sat down to take a break. And this is at this point, I kept trying to redo the grad school courses that I was supposed to redo, right? So that you can show us you're capable, I'm trying to prove myself to people. I had no business trying to prove myself to. Um I just, I sat down and I was just like, I'm done. I think I I just started working for a bank and I was still trying to do grad school courses. Um, and I just said, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't think this is where I'm supposed to be going. I don't think I'm going to be a doctor. It's just not going to happen. You've put in six years plus and 
they're going to make me go through even more hell to go back and reapply to medical school, which is truly how it, how it happens. So I said, fuck it. I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm a, I'm going to throw myself completely into mortgage finance and see where it goes. So now what was it like having that conversation with your people? I know that was like, okay, now I got to go have this conversation. What was that like? Considering oh, the pressure your whole life. Yeah. I didn't have that conversation until like a year of being at the bank where I was like solidly successful. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I didn't. Mm -mm. They were like, so what's going on with school? Oh yeah, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Like to the point, like I'm gonna be factual to the point where I have family who just found out with the drop of this podcast that I wasn't going to medical school. Oh wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So all right. So let's talk about this. How did the transition happen? You were always working in healthcare. How did mm -hmm. you get into banking and mortgage? How did that happen? Uh so when I got kicked out of medical school, um <laughs> I was living <laughs> that's what it is what it is. Um, and I was I had to get on food stamps. So you be back to the food stamps conversation. And <laughs> I was doing job job training um, in Camden, New Jersey. So to have food stamps, you had to do job training every every couple of days. Go out look for jobs to keep your food stamps. It just so happened that the uh, teacher or the counselor for the job training, um, his wife worked at HR for a mortgage company. Uh, this is Freedom Mortgage. I'll shout them out. They look crazy, but I'll shout them out. I won't drag them. Um, Freedom Mortgage had a at the time, had a training program. I think they still do. I'm not sure. But basically, for people who are non-traditional into the mortgage industry, so they they hire you, they train you, you take the licensing exam, and then they put you on their call on their uh, call floor to to do sales. They get you licensed, they get you trained, they put you on the floor. You sell mortgages, refinances, etc. That that honestly just happened to be the case. And the crazy part was. His wife, the the job trainer, his wife was in HR at Freedom. She also happened to be a Delta. So it just, uh. I gave him, I gave him my resume and he looked at it and he was just like, why are you here? And I looked at I was going to ask you that. I was like, how do you go to like to, to the, to the, to the, um, you know, um, office to get assistance and give him your resume? And they're like, hold on. You got multiple Bio what? master's degrees and all this stuff. And they like, you really want this $20 Listen. an hour job? Listen. Yes. Right now. <laughs> if you, if you want to talk about, I'm, I've never been like a, a full of myself type person just because I, I come from humble beginnings. My parents grew up in poverty, came here, made a way for themselves. Like I'm, it's, I'm not big on a lot of things, but you ever want to talk about just a moment where you just sitting in the room like, yo, what is my life right now? Mm -hmm. That was, that was a moment where I was just sitting there like, okay. We not gonna cry right now, but we definitely gonna cry later. Um, <laughs> and I was and I was crying. I was crying in a Nissan, unfortunately not a Benz. Um, and we're still we still have a Nissan. <laughs> um, not the Nissan. It, it's getting my resume. He looked at me. What are you doing here? And I'm like, I don't know. This is where I'm at. But I I need a job. And he's like, You ever done sales? I mean, I've sold a lip gloss for Amway a couple times. Let's <laughs> let's um you know I can do it just. Tell me where I'm going. Gave my resume. I got hired. And I, that was my first in, intro into the mortgage finance industry. So call center, Freedom Mortgage. Nice. So making that transition, what what about it did you like, if anything, that made you decide, okay, I can actually do this. This is something I can actually, you know, um, put some more energy into. You know what? Um, it was being able to use my psych background. Working in mental health, working in the health field, where you just got to talk to people about treatment plans and present them the best case scenario. You know, that, that for me, perfect for the sales floor. I got a couple minutes to talk to you. We got refinance you, put you in a purchase. Cool. Let me talk about the benefits, benefits to you. And just being able to listen to people and then be able to feed off that energy and then give it back to them in a way that made sense. It it, it really just worked for me, honestly. Um, mm. So shout out to my psych degree because it's still working to this day. Hey, listen, that's that's the interesting part about like life, the, the journeys that we take to get to where we're supposed to be, because mm -hmm. um, now you're helping people, um, you know, change their life in terms of buying properties. And, you know, um, you're helping a lot of people that look just like you and you have this like non-traditional journey. Right. Yeah. Um, that's that's interesting. But that, that's amazing that you, you, you found, um, you know, what it is you can do through that long journey. Right. <laughs> so now you're there for a while. And you finally and you finally tell your parents and you tell them, you know, what you're doing in banking. What's the response? So my mom was like, OK, 
whatever, whatever makes sense. Cause she kind of knew at this point I've been, it was rough. The whole yeah. entire situation was rough. Um, my dad was kind of like, you sure? Like, you sure you don't want to, you know, go back later um, and try? And I'm just like, no, it's, it's not going to work. I'm going to go crazy. Um, and it was still rough because I was like successful. Like I was mm -hmm. able to take care of myself, but we was, we were still on a, on a struggle boat because now you got student loans coming back in a repayment. But my dad was very much so still hoping, crossing his fingers, like hoping she's going to go back to medical school. She's just going to figure it out. She's going to figure it out. And my mom was just like, I get it. I understand. You seem like you're happier. So that's that's where we're at. And that Do was that. Really, yeah, that's that's <laughs> where we're at. She didn't she didn't really they didn't really press it at this point. Um because we're at least talking at this point in time. I started at Freedom and I left Freedom to go to uh MNT Bank. So we're talking three, four years now. Mm -hmm. Um and they knew the grad courses weren't working out. So really, once I kind of accepted, you're not. I'm not going back to medical school. And I was like, hey, I'm not going back. This is what I'm doing. I like what I'm doing. I want to see where this goes. Mom was like, okay. Dad was like, are you sure? Cross what did that feel like for you? To like, what kind of pressure? Like, what did that feel like to you to finally have that conversation? Finally say, this, I'm I'm done with it. I'm moving forward with this. Uh man, I felt so good. I felt relieved. I felt relieved because it just felt like I could stop holding on to what was. I just let that go. Like, this isn't it anymore. I can focus on what I'm doing, the people I'm working with, learning whatever it is I'm learning now in the finance industry, especially working for banks because it's, it's another beast in the, in the industry. I just felt, I felt better. I, I could let it go. I could stop trying to mm -hmm. figure out how to become a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. I could stop trying to figure out how to enact my purpose through medicine and then just figure out how to enact my purpose in life. That's why I was at. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That's the right there. All right. So now, um, you know, you, you, you're a loan consultant. Uh, you're helping people um, do what they have to do. Um, let me ask you a couple questions. The first question is, right, you talked about this journey that you went through to get to where you are. Um, in that journey, like, is there any book that's your favorite book or book that's inspired you to help you with that journey? Um, I dropped this book a lot, but it's the, uh, what's it called? The Magic of Thinking Big. Lord, yes. To me. Yeah. Yep, I, I know that book. Yeah, that one. Um, I reread -read that book often now. I was actually reading that book before I got accepted into medical school, and I ended up rereading it again. Um, once I was like, "Yeah, you're done. You're not going back to medical school." And I think I was just reading through it again. I, I have all these notes written through that book. That book for me was just like, "Remember the power of your mind." I promise yeah. you, like. Losing something that was so important, to me, like oh, you're gonna be a doctor. Want to be a doctor since I was five. Losing that and in the way that I lost it, where basically I was just kind of told you, you really can't do this, and mm -hmm. we don't think you can do this, and we just want you to jump through all these other hoops to prove to us you can. That's a shot to to my to my mental health. I'm sorry, I I, I don't make any bones about it. I really went through depression and anxiety around this because I didn't think I could do anything. And there was a mm -hmm. time where I just sat like I'm breezing through a lot of this, but there was times where I just wake up in full tears. Uh, in the morning time, like just dead inside. Cause I was like, I don't even know what my purpose is anymore. And I'm going to these job courses every day down in Camden to keep food stamps. And, you know, some days I can make light of it, but it's, it's, it's chipping away at who I thought I was. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, the magic of thinking big, that's a book that I refer to a lot. Yeah, that's an excellent book. I actually have the physical and the, uh, the mm -hmm. I think it's by Schwartz. The guy's name is Schwartz. David Schwartz, I think something like that. Yeah. His name is Schwartz, but, um, yeah, that's an excellent read. Um, man, you shared a lot with us, but I want to know this though. If you had to look back at this entire journey, what was the um the biggest thing that you had to overcome? Like you had a lot of different obstacles. What would you say is the biggest one? Putting boundaries in place. Okay, break that down. So yeah, I'm all oh, about to. Don't you worry, don't you worry. Um <laughs> putting boundaries in place. So something I think it happens happens a lot to um, black kids, especially when you're coming up in families that come from struggle, is we take on a lot of the things our parents could not do or wanted to do. And we, we internalize it because we watch that struggle, right? You watch your parents struggle, you watch them get through it. We internalize a lot. A lot of times I find that if we don't check ourselves and how much we over-involve ourselves, 
in our family struggle, we then continue to repeat their cycles of failure. Um, and that was the thing I had to learn, like lovingly put up a boundary. Like, hey, I definitely want to be present to be of assistance, but only with the things that I actually have to be assistance with. Some things are absolutely your problems and I can't help you because I got to help myself. Um, that's, that was that was the that was the biggest one. And I had to do it with friends, too. I, I did a lot of restructuring for myself personally just to make sure, you know, I got to be supporting myself first. And if I'm overstretched, burnt out, whichever, which happens a lot when you're trying to take on the, the load of generational wealth building, breaking generational curses. And it's like, mm -hmm. bro, I need a shot. It's a lot. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's like you, you've you also had like um, <clears throat> the strength to go and seek that help and work on yourself. Because, you know, where I come from, and, you know, I'm pretty sure Corey a co signed this too. A lot of us don't take our mental health as seriously as we should. And it's like a, mm -hmm. you know, um, a negative connotation in terms of like doing the work, yeah. but you've done the work. Um, what was it that opened you up to, to, to doing the work? Um, that's just from doing the working in mental health. I've been working in mental health since, uh, undergrad. Okay. I was, or, you know what I'm saying? Either community doing community work. I worked at, uh, uh Johns Hopkins Bayview in their outpatient site with children and adolescents. I worked in inpatient over at, a Kennedy Memorial, which is now Jefferson. So just because I already had a passion for mental health anyway, um, that was always a, a motivation, seeing it with family, mm -hmm. different things. But then who am I to have this degree, to have this work? I'm going through the struggles. And it wasn't easy because you got to find the resources and the funds. But I've done the work in those settings. I've seen what happens when you get it. There was no way I wasn't going to find me a good therapist when I knew gotcha. what was happening with me. It took a little while because, again, finding the funds, not having income at the time. Mental health resources weren't as available, at least solid ones. So I'm glad to see that that's changed a lot. Um, and I talk about that in my second episode of the podcast, mm -hmm. of my podcast. But there was there was no way I wasn't going to talk to somebody. I had to. There, I, there was no other space for me to unload and start doing the work. And I knew I wanted to be successful, but I wanted to be happy and successful. And to yeah. me... The greatest success really is to be happy and at peace. So now we have man, that. Man, was, I, talk, I talk about that often. Like, we don't talk about happiness. We're chasing so many things except happiness. But mm -hmm. listen, I can't tell you guys enough how powerful her podcast is. I feel like, um, I know it's a sound cliche, but that's like, yo, my therapy. I'll be listening to your podcast. Like, man, oh. like, no, listen, because you give it up. Like, you're very transparent in telling the story and the things that you struggle with. So, like, I listen to it and I'm inspired by it. But, um, Corey, you had a question, good brother? I do. So, because I'm in a mental health field also. I, I'm, mm -hmm. I work in a special education. And and so doing the work while you're struggling, how does that affect you when you're doing the work? Um, listen, we are human. Um, and I think most people don't talk about this, how much you struggle when you do the work. How many steps forward you make and then you jump and you slip right back because you have a rough day or um, my favorite thing is taking exams, right? Still a trigger to this day because I failed exams in medical school. So I, when I was getting my license in for being a loan officer, I failed an exam by like three points. <laughs> so be that close. And I just went through this in medical school. So it's like another life or universal moment where it's like, all right, you failed again. All right, cool. What are you going to do about it? Or you feel like you're having a great day. And again, I can only give specific examples for myself. Doing the work, working on myself and feeling capable. And then you have a rough day in a bank, which is another predominantly white institution. Sorry. Um, where management is a little bit dated in age. They're not necessarily giving me the supports. But now I'm like asking all the questions to anybody that's around me. But that within itself is still another trigger that can send me back a couple couple steps like I made all this progress and now I'm dealing with somebody else who's not supportive but they're my manager so they control how I make my money right that becomes that becomes a, a journey but to be honest for me it's just been like I gotta identify if you're having a rough moment cool let me talk to my therapist about it what's what tools can I put into place um what will help me keep my sanity that's legal <laughs> and also keep me sober to be quite right as well <laughs> Hope that hope that answers it, Corey. But it's it's a lot. It's yeah, a lot. I mean, 
No, I, I like I said, I get it. You know, I see a lot of my clients trying to work through issues and because I still work. I still work in the field. Mm-hmm. I've worked with adults I, and I work with children right now and them trying watching them struggle to do the work. And then it's, it's just kind of, to be honest, it's kind of heartbreaking. And mm-hmm. then it's like the light goes off when the light goes off. That's also like why you do it. Like if a hundred kids struggle and then I see like two or three kids and the light just yeah. goes bing, and they get it. And then it just changes my whole, mood and perspective about it's doing it yeah it, it makes me want to keep doing it and so you know i mean to me i don't need to do what i do i like to do what i do i love to do what i do so it, it makes sense you know mm-hmm. when you're talking about you know working on yourself and doing the work and then i see it every day right so like i had to work on me a lot to be able to do work with them you know what I mean? Because, you know, you come with your own pre preconceived notions and biases. And what I had to do is I have to literally put my biases away every day. Yeah. Like, and so, you know, that's when I'm, you know, working in the mental health field that I have an advantage over most people because I can put my biases away to get things done. Right. And so a lot of us can't. I mean, I when it, when it comes time to, like me and Jim have conversations all the time about how my spidey sins go off about people, but I can put my biases away mm-hmm. about those people if it's going to help the collective good of the things that we need to get done. And so that's something that I've learned actually working in the mental health field because and just transferred it over into every part of my life, right? Because you got to let people grow, right? The only, that's the only way to let people grow. You got to take the biases away and just look at what they actually do or are doing and just yes. judge them on what they're doing. And so, you know, that's part of why I asked that question. You know, like I said, I don't have doctorate level uh, <laughs> experience, but I have 20 real, years real of boy. ground level. I have yeah. 20, 20 years of ground level experience. Listen, <laughs> that's but so the reason why my journey took six years because I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I wanted to do, I wanted to do therapy, I wanted to get in the mess because there weren't enough black psychiatrists to service black communities, right? Mm-hmm. Because they try to I try to push meds and diagnoses, and sometimes it's like you don't need the meds and diagnoses. That was always my motivation. So I knew if I wanted to service that community, I always had to work in the community. So I never wasted time on it. I got myself. As soon as I knew there was a job opening, I talked to somebody, please write me a recommendation. I was working in uh, Baltimore, inner city Baltimore, and I worked in Baltimore. Right to it. Yeah, for, for many years. Um, and that's really still like my motivation and impetus for what I do in finance. It's not just about, yes, I, I want to help every Black person purchase a home, but I know there's education and there's lack of motivation or guidance that happens at just the most simple level for minorities, for Black folk, and understanding what they can and can't do. It's not, they're not getting that information. So it's just literally, again, shifted my entire like purpose into a space of, we're not going to do this through medicine, but you're definitely going to do it through finance. Because if there's anything I've learned, Finance will jack up your health just as much as that. <laughs> people don't understand else. how stressful it is to be poor. Man, listen, <sighs> the games, I'm sorry, because you got to have me on a whole soapbox. The games and the hurdles, if I didn't have education and agency for myself, at least to push back a little bit when people be on some bull in social service settings, I can only imagine what it was like for some of my clients who were coming pissed about their social worker, right? Because they kept getting jerked around. I get it. Because they put you through all these different hurdles. They make you do all this unnecessary stuff just to get simple things done. And all you need somebody to do is just break it down. This is what you need to do. These are your steps. You want to take these steps. I got you. If you don't want to take these steps, I'm going to be here when you come back because you haven't taken the right steps. And that's it. Instead, there's you have people who don't even like what they do sitting in some of these offices in charge of your benefits, in charge of all kinds of stuff. So don't don't yeah. get me on that soapbox, Corey. Yeah, um, I, 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 I have I, again I don't I don't have the, the level of the education, but I got the, the, the that ground level experience because yeah. everything that you talk about, I can I can give you a hundred examples of everything. Mm-hmm. Um you know and then working with special needs people is even w- worse, right? So I started a whole business 
to, to make sure that special needs people were advocated for in schools. So, I mean, I can't, you know, I can't say enough about, you know, the people who do the work, you know, and in, in, in work in these agencies, because I'm going to tell you, a lot of times these people's play, hearts be in the right place, but they they don't understand how literally stressful it is to be poor. Like, that's the part they're missing. They're not providing the resources. Like, they're putting these people, they're giving them crutches in, ever, in, in, in endless loops instead of solutions and empowerment. And mm-hmm. then they're keeping them in the same place because their job depends on them being in that same place. And so, you know, I don't. Does it, but I, don't, I hear you. It, no, it's, it's a mess. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, so what they'll do, they'll help you, but they'll help you to come right back because they're not empowering you to do something different to work themselves out of a job. They their Their whole purpose is to to help you enough so that you will come right back. Mm-hmm. It's like giving people, it's like giving somebody, a, a, you know, a free Zanny or a free, you know, you know, it's like free drugs. You know what I mean? Like, all right, here, you can have these free drugs, but now you become a drug addict. And Listen, you got to come right back to me. You can teach a man to fish or you can give the man to fish. You got to pick one. Right. And I'm definitely a person who will teach you as long as you want to learn. I'm not going to waste too much time. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you live, <laughs> but I'm going to teach you anything before anything else. And I'm, I'm very, I operate that way in my business model as a mortgage officer. And most people are like, nah, you know, I was like, nah, if I, if I don't get the money, I don't get the deal. Cool. But you're going to have all the education to make the best decision for yourself. You don't got to use me, but I want you to be empowered enough to know you can make a good decision. Nine times out of 10, I'm still going to get that business, but my space is always education, show you how to get it done and then let you make your decision. All right, so let's speak about that though. Let's talk about the, your, your mortgage business. Um, mm-hmm. what are what are some of the uh, let, let's let's put it this way: if you have somebody listening or watching, and mm-hmm. they want to use use your service, where are you licensed, and what kind of products do you offer? Gotcha. So I am licensed in about eleven states: uh, Maryland, Delaware, D.C., Virginia, Jersey, PA, Illinois, Michigan, California. Did I get everybody? Mm-hmm. I think that's that's about that I can think of. I feel like there's a couple that are pending in New York. We'll, 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 we'll share we'll share your information so they can yeah. get in contact with you. But with that being uh-huh. said, what kind of what kind of things do you specialize in? Any specific programs or? So I do a lot of first time home buyers. I work in a lot of grant bond programs in all the states that I'm licensed in. Georgia, forgot one. There we go. Um, but if you were trying to buy your first home and you need assistance with getting that done, I'm going to run you through the gamut of how to get those taken care of. Um, I, I'm pretty diverse, so I do renovation loans as well, which means buying a home, fixing it up. I'm starting to venture a little bit more into investor-specific products because I see a lot of my investment um, folk getting busy right now in different markets. So there isn't a lot I don't do. I just don't do commercial. Anything that's residential, I got you. Got you. Okay. I was getting ready to ask you, do you do hard money? But that's either here or there. Um, I got an, I got an alternative to hard money, but we can talk off camera. Yes, we can. All right. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, I'm going to make sure that we put um, all of uh, Elizabeth's information within the description box, so you know you can talk to her about that. And listen, um, Elizabeth is brilliant, man. So I have to ask you this question because I've, I've told you this all the time. Um, when's the book coming out? Yes. Yeah. 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 You, you, yeah. yeah. you, like you, you depriving us. Listen, you have a way with words. No. Your story, your story is inspiring, but you also have a way with words. Um, and I know that, you know, people watching this interview, like, well, listen, you talk to Elizabeth, she's brilliant and she has a way of putting things. And I'm like, you have to write a book one day. So when's the book coming out? Listen, y'all, y'all always saying this to me and I'm just like, I don't have the time right now. So I think the podcast is the nicest Outlet. segue right now for me, because I can kind of get my thoughts recorded, incorporate some folk and, and that's it. I don't, I don't have an answer on the book, y'all. I, I told yeah. you I had something coming. I dropped the podcast. Now I feel like yes, you did. No, you did. You did. You did. No, no, no. Well, you didn't lie to us. You just didn't give us the truth. We want the book. <laughs> no, no, but you know what you did though. And 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 I'm gonna still bother you about the book because I think that you 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 it's have important. A story your story is important. And your way with words. I'm hung, and I'm one hung. thing I like about books is books outlive us, right? So when you when you document your journey and your things that you got going on in your head, like that lives forever. But 
now podcasts do as well. Um, and I am a fan of your podcast. Um, so I'm going to put a link to that in the description box as well, because when you guys hear the first episode, you're going to be like dug in at that point, because um, just the, the raw honesty, um, you know, the 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 way you're going, you're going to feel connected to you like, oh, my God, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, listen, this is very inspiring. And, I, and I've told you that um, off camera. So I want to make sure I tell you on camera um, to give you your flowers, because that's a, that's an excellent job you do with the podcast. And it's called Medicine to Mortgages. Medicine. And now you know why. After listening to this episode, now you know why it's Medicine to Mortgages. I'm, I'm a, I know somebody going to hear it be like, man, F that school. I, I had a couple people reach out to me because they kind of know um, they finished, they graduated, but it's painful. So. Yeah. Um, I had I had to tell it. I had to tell it. I'm trying to get it to as many people who it's going to resonate with. And I'm super grateful that it has resonated with so many people. Because um, it's like, you know, you get worried, like, you know, not everybody goes to medical school. They're going to get it. But at the same time, I'm like, yo, this is life. Shit happens. You sometimes don't get an opportunity to redeem yourself. Sometimes you are really just dealt your hand and you just got to make the best out of it. And Listen, um. <laughs> It's it's crazy because I I have you know a lot of friends who are um you know um first generation they're they're kids of immigrants, and that pressure is something that all of them talk about like not one or two, all of them and I'm like it's crazy. I mean, so me and Corey um you know went to Central right here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. very, very tough high, academic high, in, high high um immigrant population. All right. So I remember students like like getting just an A on their test and being the hallways crying. Crying about an egg. I'm sitting there struggling, like, yo, I would cry to get, get an A. I would cry to get what you got, and you're crying because you didn't get an A plus. And I'm like, my father is. I'm like, I just it, it never. They would, they would get a ninety and cry. <laughs> I'm sitting there with my eighty one, like seventy nine. Like, yo, what are you <laughs> why would you guys listen? Um, I'm so sorry for the family going to see this. I love my dad. He literally like two doors over, but it's whatever. Um, <laughs> so my, I remember I came home one day with a report card. And I had a couple bees on there. And I remember this man saying to me, dead to my face, you know, those bees can turn into seeds. You got to do better. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. That was, I, was like, I was like. I mean, and the funny thing is they mean well. They, they call themselves yeah. protected. I mean, that has to be so much pressure. And I guess the where I'm going with this uh, whole line of, um, you know, question and talk is, um, do you find yourself like mentoring folks who were kids of immigrants that may be dealing with that same pressure because i could imagine it's like yeah they need, they need that they need someone to talk to that understands it um so i mentor kids of immigrants um i also mentor uh low income kids as well because it's mm -hmm. i feel like that pressure is the same you know what i mean okay. you, like for me I, I i can't fully relate but i feel like that pressure to just create something you've never seen for your family and mm -hmm. that pressure to, to dig your family out, especially when people put it on you on top of them. You're like, oh yeah, you're the smart one. You're going to take the oh, family to this place, this thing. You know, I find that it's a universal pressure for um, a lot of black you're people. Afraid that you're afraid to make mistakes because you know how everybody looks at you? Listen, that, that that's just the pressure. And I've, I've definitely worked with um, a lot of first generation college students and it's it's the same thing for being like first you know first generation immigrant. It's it's a it's, that pressure is still the same where you feel like the burden of the family legacy is on your shoulders and you have no idea how to manage it. All right, all right. So yeah. so so listen to this. Everybody in my family graduated from college, and I didn't want to go. And I went to one of the best public high schools in the country. I wanted to be a first generation entrepreneur, and they was like, "We're not paying for that." You can, mm -hmm. take, you can take your heads to college or you can get you can start working like so like the, the pressure of <laughs> you know what I mean like we, we don't talk enough about that period about family yeah. pressure yeah. to do things especially around higher education yeah. now, it well, doesn't, you know what, it's kind of the conversation we had about like um just resources in general right when you come from a certain level of resources it actually gives you more time it does. That's why you see. That's why. That's why when you look when you look at the Silicon Valley, you see like you know the founders of Facebook, the founders of Twitter, Google. They all come from like upper middle class families. Mm -hmm. They had they had the ability to literally dream and think about, okay, what about did this or did that because they didn't have to worry about you know um, where the next meal was coming from. They didn't have to worry about helping out around the house. Like they they didn't have those worries. Um, and again, this is a conversation about. This Us is basically yeah. playing from behind. We're playing from behind. That's just this, that's is, just this is a conversation about resources. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or resources. lack thereof. <laughs> and having those resources allows your brain to have a certain space to create. Yeah. Yeah. And create things that people have never seen. So it's it's nuts. Like I get it because I like you know from that from those generations. The older generations are very big on get your education, get a degree, go to school, da da da, get the job. And it's like, man, what opportunities are missed on on being able to lead the way. Through, entre- through, through entrepreneurship, right? Mm-hmm. To create something that nobody else has seen. Um, it's, I, it's nuts. It's nuts. But I was like, dang, you, you know, had I not gone this far, who, who, who's, who would have said I wouldn't have my own mortgage company at this point? I'm not saying I will or won't. Just, you know, making a point, like my energy could have been put in such a different space if I gave myself the freedom sooner to just mm-hmm. go for it yes. and not be afraid of all the pushback or dropping the baton. Yeah, I mean, but, I'm, but see, I, I also believe that pressure is good, right? Mm-hmm. Because pressure, pressure gives you a chance to elevate, right? Because if you if you ain't under no pressure, the chances that you're going to elevate are very very slim, right? Because exactly. you're going people don't don't operate at their highest level; they operate at the highest level that they're forced to operate at, mm-hmm. right? So you pressure is not not to say that pressure is bad, but that that, that pressure. It, it it has a, an effect. It has you know you know the pressure of not graduating high school and not graduating college. That was just that was heavy. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like most people in my neighborhood, nobody in their family graduated from college. Right. My mom, my dad, <laughs> my uncles, my aunts, all of them. They all graduated from college. I was the only kid on the block that had a, a whole different kind of pressure, and it helped me in school because i was like yo i gotta really sit here i gotta pay attention i gotta focus because if i go home with a c my mom might uppercut me and knock me clean out my you know knock me out the box she might put me on the porch i might have to sleep outside you know with the vagrants and the, and the people but you the also had the, the tools to, you had the tools to deal with that pressure some people don't and yeah. the, the, those results are, are, are disastrous yeah. You so, know, you know, it's, it's and, a nuance. And for the I'm record, saying. I gotta put this on the podcast. My mom was never gonna put me out. I'm just I'm just saying that. <laughs> that's that's the anxiety <laughs> you held though. You were like, I it was it was just I don't want to disappoint them. I know yeah, how hard, yeah, I know yeah, how hard yeah, yeah. they work. You know what I'm saying? I know what they're doing, I know what they've done. Yo, my mom, think. my mom worked two jobs her entire life and and and, and gave away time that she could have been spending with us to make sure that we had everything that we needed. School was our job. Blah, yeah. blah blah, you know what I mean. So that's yeah. pressure. Like she yeah. was putting the pressure on us by doing the right thing. Like my mom could have turned to drugs; she could have did anything, but she yeah. put the pressure on us by taking her ass to work every day and then getting back up and going to her second job, so that when any time we asked, we had. Like yeah. that's a whole different kind of pressure. Yeah, than, you know what I mean. But it's still pressure. You know what I mean. So I, you know. I'm I'm definitely not taking no shots at my miss. She did everything. <laughs> no, no, I got you. I, got you. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just want to make sure we acknowledge though that you had the tools to deal with it, and some people just don't. That's why it's a real nuanced conversation. So pressure can be good for some folks that that tend to you know take that pressure and rise, but then others get crushed by it and they never really reach their potential. So it's it's got to be contained in a way that can move you forward. You know what I mean? You can, mm-hmm. you can launch the rocket, or you can end up with a whole explosion yeah that's that's really that's really what it is but it's i just i'm in a space of where i rather plant the seed that everybody can get those tools in order to manage that pressure because yeah. life really is it's just series of pressure you, I, I just told a, uh one of my friends like yo life is gonna life you gotta life figure out life. life is gonna life you just we gotta figure out how to manage it and you couldn't get me to say something like that out my mouth a few years like years back when i was going through it i was like man F all this. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? That's why. But that's why people like you are so important to our community because you have your journey. But now you can feed into others based upon your experience. You know what that's like. You know what I mean? Um, it's difficult for someone who's never had those challenges to talk to someone who does have those challenges. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's funny, right? So when Corey and I talk to the, the, the young guys, like you know, in a, in a neighborhood or, or, or in, a, in a youth study center, and you know, we come from the same neighborhoods they do. But sometimes there'll be people that aren't, that don't look like us, and they're trying to tell them what to do, and they, they, you know, they look at them funny, right? Because how do you know? You know, you're you're a white man yeah, from Lake right. County. How can you tell me what it feels like to be from North Philly? Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So when you go through those things and have those experiences, now you have um, value that you can, you know, put back out to the community. So and you and the thing is, you're willing to do that, which is amazing. 
Oh right? yeah. So, oh so yeah. Congratulations and salute to you for that. Now, last thing I'm gonna ask you is this, Elizabeth. What is the future for your business and and and, and everything you've got going on? What do you what does the future look like? What are some of the things you want to work on? Oh man. Um we're definitely growing this podcast a little bit more. Um, starting to work into some spaces where I can do some more public speaking. That's that's on the podcast side of things. That's kind of my labor of love. It feels very normal and natural from a from a finance standpoint. You know, we're we're making some moves in, in the mortgage industry where I can start doing a little bit more networking, a little bit more uh, community involvement. Um, for me right now, I, I can't say too much because some the ink hasn't dried on a couple things. So just know some things are coming <laughs> and I can't speak fully on it, but I will say for me, it's, it's a growth of, uh, growing impact in a way that's meaningful. So I can help more people with financing, um, and still give back to the community. That's, that's where the business is starting to shape where I get to be a little bit more meaningful and purposeful in what I do. And, you know still help no absolutely absolutely i mean listen anything you need from us we're here to help because um we appreciate the work you do and you know um, we're fans um fanboy you got anything no i'm just a fanboy that's it (laughs) (laughs) so listen i I just want to say thank you for um everything that you do um and continue to share your story and and and, um be as transparent because i i told you um, you're like my life coach that you don't even realize you're my life coach. I'll be listening like, I got to do more of that. You know what I mean? I, I like to listen to you when we do our Friday show so I can start sharing my, I've been, and the funny thing is it actually, I've been sharing more of my personal story because, you know, listening from, listening to medicine and mortgages because, you know, so thank you. No, thank you. Listen, thank you guys for having me. I love what you guys do in the community. I already told you, sign me up. Um, in any way that I can contribute, I want to, I can't, I can't say I'm going to have my own company anytime soon, but you never know where life takes you. I'm just, I'm just a vessel at this point for real. Like I, I really don't have any other way to say it. It's, I'm just here to inspire and to help and to enjoy that's life. Cause I like nice things. Don't get me wrong. That's right. That's right. <laughs> gotta be happy. Yes. You know, and that's the one thing we got to talk more about is what makes you happy. Right. Listen, my mama wants to be taken on trips. Okay. I'm, I'm now a parent. To senior toddlers, that's where I'm at. <laughs> senior yeah, toddlers, to I, like senior that. toddlers. <laughs> I like that. So I, gotta, I gotta now, you know, it's, it's my birthday, but she's like, So, what'd you give me uh, on my birthday? That's what you, you know, that's actually a day for you to celebrate your parents because that's the day that they listen, you know, that Corey, you were conceived. Corey, don't support her, okay? I didn't have a choice. I, hey, listen, hey, listen, my bills, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I to be here. <laughs> yeah. Actually, listen, um, uh, for the people out there watching, I'll make sure to share uh, all of Elizabeth's contact mm-hmm. information, um, you know, her social media, and uh, as well as the podcast, so you guys can take a look at everything she got going on. Please, um, please. Make sure you know, reach out to her, let her know you heard her on here, and make sure you listen to the podcast as well. Um, and definitely listen to her podcast. I'm telling you, that first episode is everything, and then the second episode is fire too. Like, I listen, man. I told you, I'm a fan. Um, but with that being said, though, I um, just want to say thank you again for sharing your story and being so transparent, even on our show. Um, and, you know, much continued success with everything you got going on. Listen, I appreciate it. I'm always here. There's more coming. I just. Oh, yeah. I just got to be quiet. I got you. Right now. I understand. Right. Right. Book. Book. right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, the book, the book's book. not coming yet, but. um. I'm definitely collaborating with some other folk in higher learning, and higher education to just kind of talk about, again, trying to help Black folk get resources and more awareness on the struggles that happen for us as we as we progress. I'm, I'm just, mm-hmm. again, I'm here for it. Like we, our mental is everything. So I hope everybody, if you take nothing away from this at all, get your mental right. Hey, listen, man, Marshawn Lynch said, take care of your chicken and take care of your mentals. Listen, right? I've, I've always been a fan of Marshawn Lynch, like always. I that He hits a strong spot, like right here every time I see him. When he's just like, I'm just here so I don't get fined. Exactly. Yeah, listen, he's he's another yeah. one of the people who's their authentic self, no matter where they're in that environment. authentic self, yeah, 100% I you, I, of the I time. Admire, listen, I admire people like that. So for our audience out there, listen, as we always say, it's not about how much money you make. It's about how much you keep. Game elevates, and we'll see you guys on our next episode. Peace. Bye.